a poem, Blue Jay Heart. There's a lot of squawk and noise in my Blue Jay Heart. Too much loud anxiety, endless clamoring of things yet to be accomplished. I land on a branch of stillness, only long enough to catch my scattered disturbances. Then I quickly fly forth into the web of life with, with a raucous cry of activity, slashing through the peaceful air with a voice of scolding urgency. Have you felt this restlessness, clamoring, disturbances, urgency, longing? I know there are seasons and moments that I feel myself landing on a branch of silence only long enough to catch my disturbances. So I ask myself, I ask you, where in your life do you become most easily restless and discontented? Where is that place of dissatisfaction for you? In your job? your relationships, with your possessions, where you live, your finances, or perhaps just within yourself. There are different ways in which discontentment manifests in our life. But if we pause and become aware of what is going on within us, we can discover the impact it has on our entire being. Discontentment can plunge us into a personal crisis, either an unsustainable drive to do more and to achieve more, or to give up hope because nothing we obtain or achieve can ever really satisfy and fulfill us. How many, so, how many people end up in a so-called midlife crisis precisely because of this realization? How many times do we reach a point where we can no longer deny our restlessness? So do we want, desire too much? So much that nothing can ever fully satisfy and fulfill us? Well, C.S. Lewis says the contrary. He says, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. And Jesus, keenly aware of the tension we would experience when we try to insert our lives into kingdom life, started eagerly teaching us another way. And we know this teaching as the Sermon on the Mount. He invites us to see that we all belong in this kingdom life, but that we're in different spaces and come with different challenges. So he says to us something along the lines of not trying to squeeze our lives into his plan, but rather to allow his plan to shape our lives into the kingdom life he envisions for us because he knows it will be good. It will be the fulfilled life we long for. There's a lot to learn from this teaching. And even just the Beatitudes, a part of this sermon, are powerfully transformative. So let's just take one today. Read with me two verses, and I'm going to read two translations since it helps us really just get an idea of what Jesus said here. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. And it's trouble ahead if you're satisfied with yourself. Yourself will not satisfy you for long. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. You're blessed when you're ravenously hungry. Then you're ready for the messianic meal. Jesus lived the way he's teaching us and he showed us that way of the kingdom life, this life with him. And his urgency is not for us to get it right, but for us to let him in so he can help us discover and choose this way of life. This is why we practice spiritual disciplines, because we want to want this life and then begin living it. And Jesus says to us, watch out, be careful, take heed. There's so much you have to learn and go through. But look, there is a way, there is a life, and it's through me. This way is for each of us, wherever we may be on our journey. But there are dangers, and it camouflages strangely well. Here the danger is when we live a life 
where we are mildly satisfied. Do you know that feeling usually around 10 a.m. when you start feeling peckish, so you grab something conveniently close and you eat it, and it's not good for you. In my case, it's usually peppermints or a chock chip cookie. But it suffices, and you're mildly satisfied. Not like you would have been if you had had a good, wholesome Sunday lunch. Not like the slow savoring of a delicious meal, but mildly satisfied. I think there's an emoji to describe the state of being. It's meh, just meh. And it's disturbingly easy to slide into the state of being. And here's how we do it. We chase a temporary high that gives us an endorphin boost. For some, it's shopping, a weekend away, food, a drink, social media, binging a series, even sport and exercise. Now, none of these are bad, but when we chase these highs to still the craving for significance, for joy, for connection, they may displace God and leave us wanting. Or we fall into the trap of being mildly satisfied by comparing. I can't be that happy because I don't have what he does. I don't have the means. I would be completely satisfied if my life was like hers. Don't we all do that? We settle for being mildly satisfied because everyone else's life is better than ours. Or, on the other hand, we settle for this mediocre contentment because when compared to others, we have so much to be grateful for. So how can I say I want more? Comparison traps us either way. Numbing also leads us to just carry on feeling sort of content. It's easier than really feeling what we feel, so we keep busy. We try to have fun, we build pleasure into our lives, and then we can't feel the discomfort. And another way we stay here in the middle, we simply stick to the superficial, perhaps as a way to narrow our vision so we don't have to recognize where in our lives and in our world things have become thwarted and moved away from how God intended it and us to be. And this is Jesus' warning. He's not sending us on a guilt trip or judging us for shortcomings. He's saying, watch out for this mild satisfaction that you get when you look for sustenance in yourself or in that which can be found within the restrictive measures of being human. It won't do for you what you desperately need done. It will blind you to the truth. It will leave you disillusioned, disappointed disappointed and questioning the reason for your existence and why the world is the way it is. It will even challenge your sense of value and significance. It will taunt you into thinking that your life has been meaningless and your presence has had no effect. And this may just destroy you. There's trouble ahead if you're satisfied with what you can do and achieve for yourself and gather for yourself. Reaching for yourself and what your own efforts can muster is like reaching for the conveniently placed snack rather than sitting down at the table, waiting for the meal being prepared for you. And don't get me wrong, sitting down at the table is no passive act. It's a spiritual discipline turning from yourself to God to receive. And in this discipline, we don't make ourselves into the kind of people who can live fully alive to God. Only God can accomplish this in us. God freely and graciously invites us to participate in this transforming process, but not on our own. Because every time we go on our own, we end up back where we started. And sadly, we often don't even recognize it because we get used to feeling this way. It becomes our normal state of being. But there's something profound about admitting that you are ravenously hungry. Have you noticed how good something tastes when you're really, really hungry? I remember I was abroad with Tienis, my husband, when we went to experience Taizai, something about contemplative life. The curveball to this trip was that I just found out I was pregnant. And everything smelled strange and tasted worse. But the less I could stomach, the hungrier I became. I fantasized about a baked potato with sour cream and tomato with salt. 
perhaps a strange pregnancy craving, but then in, in my mind, it became the meal fit for a king. And this was not what was being prepared in the monastery we were staying, believe me. But when I returned to South Africa, we sat down at the airport spur and I ate that potato and tomato like I'd never had food before. The tastes and the textures, the combination between them. I mean, even the colors and smells. And then the memory, both of the longing and the satisfaction. And Jesus uses this metaphor of being hungry and fully fed to help us see that recognizing this longing, the deep desire for something more and something truly good, even if we don't yet have the words to describe it or the spiritual maturity to recognize what the hunger is for, just recognizing the hunger in itself is a great blessing. When you realize you're hungry, you start looking for sustenance. So Jesus says, blessed are you. Feel your hunger. Recognize your longing. Be ravenously hungry for joy, for beauty, for peace, for connection, for meaning. And in Matthew's version, he mentions specifically for righteousness. And perhaps we can frame this as a longing for God's heart, for his people and his world to come into being for things to be as they should be and how God created us to be. So don't minimalize this longing for more. Don't pretend, don't rationalize it away. This hunger is a gift because it drives you to seek out what you long for and you end up finding not something, but someone, not just anyone, but Jesus. It's your soul calling out for survival, to flourish, rather than settling for a slow, quiet death. We're made this way. Babies scream unceasingly when they're hungry and they will drink only what their bodies need. They crave and scream for milk. And then we get older and we adapt and sacrifice that very urgency that captures our attention for what really is necessary. So what if you admit it, you want more? What if you owned that you're always at least a little bit dissatisfied? What if you allowed yourself to be moved by what isn't as God intended it to be? Because then you are open to being truly nourished. The promise is that we will be satisfied. There is a messianic meal. And isn't it so appropriate that Jesus would choose a meal with physical bread and wine to help us understand what life with him is and would be like. He gives us the communion and says to us, remember, think of me, take this bread and eat, drink this wine. He uses bread to show us that he gives us himself to still our hunger pains. He uses wine to remind us that he gives us himself, his life, so that we always would have sustenance that would give us what we would need to live a good and meaningful life with him. He's compassionately looking you in the eye and saying, I am enough. For all that you have tried that did not suffice, I promise you, I won't disappoint you. For every time you ventured more than you should have or knew you could, and you were hurt and you were left wanting, I will show you that I am what you long for. Although the world may disappoint and treat you and others unjustly, I will show you goodness and righteousness. I will help you see. I will satisfy you in these hunger pains. The woman at the well was so aware of her discontentment. She makes plans to avoid anyone and anything that would make her face herself and her reality again. That's why she's fetching water alone in the heat of the day. And Jesus leads her to recognize this longing and then offers her living water. She would thirst no more. Anyone who drinks of the water I have to offer, Jesus says, will never thirst again. So that unnerving sense of, is this it? What have I done with my life? Will I make something of myself? That thirst can be quenched. 
that gnawing feeling of things will never be as good as it was again. Life isn't worth it with this loss I now have to carry. Or things have become so bad, I don't know how to hope anymore. That thirst can be quenched in him, in opening up to his nourishment and sustenance. Once you recognize your longing, you are open to be truly nourished. One of our congregation members was diagnosed with cancer, and I watched her journey. As she started coming in contact with her inner being, she realized something of this longing to connect, to find meaning. And as she went through round after round of chemo, she started blossoming. She had opened up anew to this messianic meal. She stood open arms in front of God to be truly nourished and how she was. And more than that, her life became a place from which others could now drink. When she sat in that chair with a drip flowing into her already frail body, she smiled at her new friends, the people around her. She shared her pain and concerns with her community. She saw glimmers of hope in everything around her. Her tough days were dark, but the light never moved beyond her sight. And throughout this journey, she had a testimony. She had meaning. She had joy. Life or death events can sometimes be a catalyst in helping us realize that we have a voice calling out from within us, demanding more than what we settle for. But what if we begin opening up to this true nourishment, this sustenance now, every day? Start simply as you can. Of course, we find the sustenance in God's word. We find his truth. We see how he advocates for his people. We see him love people. How do you open up to his life-giving words of consolation? I found that when I'm feeling depleted and I don't quite know how to take in God's words, it helps me to speak to a spiritual guide. I'm so grateful for how God has used her in my life. You may want to try the week of guided prayer this week in which someone journeys with you to listen to how you are hearing God or struggling to discern his voice through the noise of so many other voices. But Jesus' life shows us that he found profound sustenance in many ways. We can follow him in these ways as well. God came to him through fellowship with his loved ones, both his family and his friends, but also the disciples, the group he had gathered around him with which he ministered and shared life. He also experienced God in silence and setting himself aside. He found joy in celebrating with others and enjoying a good meal. He rested. He walked long walks. He listened and learned from others. He prayed. He went to worship with others. He spent time with children. And how contagious their joy can be. How is Jesus coming to you to satisfy your longing? What if you try just one of these practices this week? Find your true life in kingdom life. Find your hunger and let it take you to the table. Hold on tightly to real sustenance, but more than that, hold on tightly to the provider of that sustenance and let him lead you to being fully awake to him. Let this life and energy pulse through your veins, finding yourself satisfied in him, yet wanting always more of him at the same time. Don't wait. Don't postpone. Grab this life and live it. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for teaching us, but showing us through your example as well, how we can live this life that you invite us to. Lord, I pray that you will help us become aware of how we fill the voids that we experience, how we fill those gaps that we feel. Lead us, Lord, to a place where we can open up to you, that we can let that love flow into us and through us, that we can know what it is like, feel what it is like to be truly nourished as we sit in your presence, as we live through your presence, as we see the way you do. Transform us, Lord. 
Thank you. Thank you for your friendship. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The love of God our Father, the friendship and the grace of Jesus Christ His Son, and the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit is with each of us. Amen. Amen.